forum a success. <clears throat> it was a sheer pleasure to listen to the speakers who have preceded me. Uh, let me tell you that some of those speeches were very informative, but one particular speech was inspiring, and this was given by Air Marshal Sohail Aman. And as somebody mentioned, that he started with the Lama Iqbal, our common point of reference for... I've had an opportunity to witness some of his successes and demonstration of his leadership as Air Chief. I'm also indebted to you, sir, because I recall that when I was heading the Institute for Strategic Studies, you invited me to speak at the Air Headquarters where you had assembled an audience of officers, not only in the headquarters, but from all around the seven bases that were connected through video link. And at that time, I was asked to speak on Pakistan's foreign policy and China-Pakistan economic corridor. Yesterday, I was reminiscing that I didn't have that kind of opportunity ever before or since then. So thank you so much. <clears throat> the content of the discussion today has been very rich and I would uh, start my substantive remarks by recalling what President Clinton said during his first campaign and he said it's economy stupid. This was not the phrase that he crafted, one of his staffers crafted it. They were talking about different themes for the campaign, for the election campaign. But one tired staffer wrote a sticker which said, it is economy stupid. And then everybody became clear about their priority and the priority of the campaign. You can extrapolate that theme to Pakistan. Although we have many priorities, defense, national security, national unity, we are pursuing the right to self-determination for the people of Jammu and Kashmir. We have foreign policy challenges. We are countering terrorism, but it is economy. That is our strategic priority. It is in that context that the Constitution of Southeast Asia Business Forum is very important. I will talk about Southeast Asia. I've had some association with the region. About one and a half decades ago, or 15 years ago, I was Director General East Asia Pacific in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I've been associated with this region directly or indirectly. I'll divide it into two parts. One is, of course, Northeast Asia, and the other is Southeast Asia. Northeast Asia includes China, the two Koreas, and Japan. And Southeast Asia has 11 members. 600 million people, one of the largest economies in the world, cumulatively, the entire block. I think it should be nearly three trillion dollars. And some of the countries have made tremendous progress over the years. Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, Brunei, Darussalam, Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines, and some are catching up, like Cambodia, like Laos, like Myanmar. Way back in 2003, I can tell you that we launched a campaign under the banner Vision East Asia. Why? Because we realized at that time that our entire foreign policy, 
was oriented towards the West or centered on the Middle East. And we were losing opportunities in Southeast Asia. We had, even at that time, very close ties with China and also with Japan and South Korea, but not with Southeast Asians. And that's why we came up with Vision East Asia. Now, I will also tell you, this is directly related to the topic under discussion today, and your banner as a matter of fact, in 2004, we entered into ARF, it, the date was July the 2nd, and on the same day, Pakistan signed our Treaty of Amity and Cooperation with ASEAN. And this was a landmark. And a year later, we signed an agreement with ASEAN on counter-terrorism, on combating terrorism. Now, these are the underpinnings of our relationship with the region, Pakistan's relationship with the region. Our total trade with the region, Southeast Asia, is about 6.6 .6 billion, out of which 5.5 billion are our imports. And we export about 800 million to $1 billion to all the 10 countries. So there's a huge deficit there. We have managed to become a sectoral dialogue partner with the region. And we've been striving for years to become a full dialogue partner, but that goal has evaded us. We have signed FTAs with Malaysia and Indonesia, but we have not been able to sign an FTA with ASEAN as a block or as a whole. We have already done a joint feasibility study of an FTA with ASEAN. Let me also tell you that chambers of commerce in ASEAN countries or Southeast Asian nations are keen to have a relationship with uh, the FPCI, Federation of Chamber of Commerce and Industries in Pakistan. And uh, I used to advocate very strongly that our federation should look east, look towards Southeast Asian nations. Why? Because the environment there is hospitable towards Pakistan. You do not find the prejudices or hostilities about Pakistan or misplaced perceptions about Pakistan that you find in the Western countries. And I think slowly and gradually Pakistani entrepreneurs and business persons, they started going to the East they started invested in the East Asian nations. You also have a diaspora community there, a large diaspora community, which works as an interface between Pakistan and Southeast Asia. You also have attracted foreign direct investment from Southeast Asia. Malaysia, Indonesia have been particularly active in many sectors here in Pakistan, but that's not adequate. And as I, as I mentioned, your investors and entrepreneurs have gone to that region also. I do not want to talk about Northeast Asia or CPEC or the BRI because that's a separate subject. Let me talk about Kashmir. On this occasion, I want to express my deepest gratitude to Malaysia and to ASEAN as a whole for expressing their solidarity with the people of Jammu and Kashmir and for supporting Pakistan's stance on Kashmir. 
couple of months ago in Muzaffarabad, I received a parliamentary delegation of Malaysia. And a few days ago, I received an ASEAN delegation, a delegation, a parliamentary delegation, which met not only the speaker and the parliamentary leadership here in Pakistan, but also visited Azad Kashmir, the line of control, and we had an extensive session and a joint press conference with them. And as the said, they condemned the actions, illegal actions that were taken by India on August the 5th. Second, they said that they would support the right to self-determination and right to freedom of the people of Jammu and Kashmir. And they gave us the good news that they had established an advocacy group for Kashmir in their respective parliaments. And they had also started a grassroots campaign to create awareness about Kashmir. So thank you ASEAN, thank you Malaysia. The situation in Kashmir is horrendous. I spoke briefly about it yesterday evening. But the situation is so horrifying that it cannot be reduced to words. The best of the best journalists have written about the situation in a mainstream international media. They've written in Washington Post or Wall Street Journal or The Guardian or uh, The Telegraph and all television networks have tried to bring footage from the besieged territory of Jammu and Kashmir. And yet all the information that we have today with us is just tip of the iceberg. It doesn't describe even a fraction of the tragedy that is unfolding in Kashmir. People have been imprisoned in their houses, streets are empty, 13,000 boys as young as 12, 13 and 14 have been incarcerated in concentration camps and they've been sent to the most notorious prisons in northern India and they are being tortured there. Women are molested and raped and sexually abused and they are being projected as spoils of war and their bodies are being objectified. And I can tell you that there is a human rights and humanitarian crisis unfolding every day in Kashmir. The entire territory has been besieged and the entire population is being brutalized. The people of Jammu and Kashmir have been made aliens in their own homeland. Now, this is called genocide in accordance with international law. This is called ethnic cleansing. This is called war crimes. This is called crimes against humanity. And let me tell you, I won't say that the world reaction to this catastrophe of our times has been muted. No, it hasn't. In fact, for the first time in decades, the international media and think tanks Parliamentarians in Europe and North America, they have spoken up. They have spoken up for the rights of the people of Jammu and Kashmir. And the United Nations has 193 members. And out of these 193, besides Pakistan, only four countries. Four countries, China, 
Turkey, Iran, and Malaysia have openly spoken up for the rights of the Kashmiris. Other countries have been tight-lipped. They've been equivocating and prevaricating. And their stances are ambivalent because their strategic and economic interests are tied with India. And therefore, they're practicing real politics and the very advocates of promotion and protection of human rights are giving this criminal cover to the perpetrators of atrocities in Kashmir. So I would say that the reaction to the horrors in Kashmir has been mixed. And our challenge is how to remove this barrier of silence amongst Western capitals in official Washington and official London and official Brussels. How to remove that impediment. That's not all. Let me tell you that India has whipped up war hysteria against Pakistan and against Azad Kashmir and their defense minister has threatened to attack Azad Kashmir and disintegrate Pakistan and obliterate the state of Pakistan because it was a cardinal sin that the Muslims of India committed in 1947 by creating a separate homeland. This is not conjecture, this is not speculation. This is not my hyperbole. This is what their responsible cabinet ministers are saying through megaphone diplomacy. So you've been warned, the people of Pakistan have been warned that India is going to attack you. The people of Azad Kashmir have been warned that India is going to attack Azad Kashmir and retake it. And my question to the entire nation, to the government, to the state institutions, to civil society, to men and women of Pakistan is, are you preparing yourself for a response? Are you preparing yourself to defend your country and to defend your value system? That's not all. India says that Bharat Bhumi or Khan Bharat is impure because within South Asia there is no room for Muslims because they are outsiders or they are converts. If they are converts, they should come back to Hinduism. And if they are outsiders, Central Asians, or from Pakistan or from Western regions, they should go back to those regions. They would cleanse India. They would cleanse South Asia. And this is not what I am saying. This is what their leaders are saying. The cabinet ministers, Amit Shah, the president of Bhatia Janata Party, and Mohan Bhagwat, who is the president of Rashtriya Swayam Sevak San. And again, they're using megaphones to broadcast that message. You've been warned. And that's why they decided to disenfranchise 1.9 million Muslims of Assam. And their crime, that they were Muslims. Let me tell you that here some representatives of the international community are also present. It is a war between India and Pakistan. This war would not remain confined to the conventional plane. It would spiral into a nuclear conflict with dire consequences. And if there is this war, according to scientists, some 1 1.125 million people would be killed instantly. And ultimately 2.5 billion people would be affected 
all around the world. The reason I highlight this is that if there is a war and India is creating this stiff towards war, only India and Pakistan would not suffer. The entire world would suffer and therefore it is the responsibility, the collective responsibility of the international community, the United Nations Security Council or the leaders of the existing world order to stem this drift towards war. So I appeal to the international community through this platform to save the people of Jammu and Kashmir from genocide and to save this region and the world from the scourge of war. Let me talk about Azad Kashmir briefly. In Azad Kashmir, of course, we face the consequences of India's hostilities every day. Every day, every now and then, the Indian soldiers, occupation forces, deployed along the line of control, they fire across the line of control and target our civilians. 540,000 civilians are living there. Uh, 80,000 families are affected directly or indirectly by their fire. People are martyred. People become handicapped and disabled for life. They have started firing cluster munitions which take lives of children, which have taken lives of children. Houses are destroyed, crops are burnt, livestock are killed. So we have devastation there too in Azad Kashmir. But let me tell you that for the past several years we've been focused on economic development. And I was listening to you, Madam, about your exposition and some other things that you mentioned, Ms. Seema Tahir. Uh, we're doing that stuff. Like, for instance, we're investing in infrastructure and health and education, and also we're promoting tourism. You talked about attractive landscapes of Pakistan. Uh, South Kashmir also have stunning, most beautiful landscapes in the world. And we attract tourists, in fact, every year, some 1.5 million tourists from Pakistan come to Azad Kashmir. But we are not ready to absorb or welcome tourists from abroad because our infrastructure is very basic. So we're trying to transition this arrangement that we have for tourism or this infrastructure that we have for tourism into a proper industry so that we can receive tourists from all over the world. And of course, <clears throat> we are investing in quality education and some of the disciplines that you mentioned are being taught in Azad Kashmir like artificial intelligence, machine learning, automation, uh, internet of things, biotechnology, you'd be surprised to know that even the remote parts of Azad Kashmir, these subjects are being taught. So we are sharply focused on economic development of Azad Kashmir. 4.2 million people. Now, <clears throat> I'm just moving towards the concluding part of my remarks and I'd say that the people of Pakistan, 212 million people, and you're right, madam, about 130 million people are below the age of 30. So this is the youth bulk that we talk about. This is the advantage that Pakistan has. We have to prepare for the future because of the emergence and mainstreaming of new technologies. We are not preparing for today or tomorrow. We are preparing, or we ought to be preparing ourselves 
for the next two decades so that Pakistan can emerge as one of the top 10 economies of the world by year 2050. At least that should be our ambition. And one hidden fact about Pakistan is that we have 86 million people belonging to the middle class. Forbes wrote about it back in 2015. And we do not know this class because this is undocumented. This is undocumented because they do not want to pay taxes. And that's why we have this crisis. You have 86 million middle class people in Pakistan. And if they start paying taxes, you will not have to go to Qatar or to UAE or to Saudi Arabia or to China or to the IMF for sustaining your economy or balancing your books. Let me also talk about leadership and uh, yes, Air Marshal, Air Marshal, Air Marshal Aman, Air Chief Marshal Sohail Aman talked about leadership and he gave practical examples. Once again, I compliment you. In a sense, I would say that that example could be extrapolated to Pakistan as a whole. We have all the ingredients ingredients for becoming a great country, the population, the kind of land that we have, its strategic location. I talked about the middle class, the youth bulge. And yet, we do not get it right. And we have lost so many opportunities. We have to build these coalitions. What is leadership? Leadership is about inspiration, inspiring a nation, but it's also about building coalitions. It's also about consensus building. So the bulk or the majority of the people follow the leader or a group of leaders within the country and they deliver results, tangible results. Leadership is not merely aspirational. Leadership is solid and concrete as we see its demonstrations in the Western countries. I would also compliment you and Pakistan Air Force because when I was Pakistan's ambassador in China I've had the opportunity of interacting with Air Force negotiators, negotiators who were transacting with their Chinese counterparts. And I can tell you that their corporate model is probably by far the best in Pakistan. Why? Because they are quite autonomous, they make decisions on the spot, and they are accountable. And that makes a difference. And that's, that explains your success in Camera and GF-17 and other platforms that you have created. I'll tell you that you also ventured into uh, creating an iPad. It was called Takhti 7 or whatever. And I presented it to United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon because this was very innovative. This was very bold thinking. Let me also tell you that, uh, again, talking to Ms. Seema Tahir, our investment in human capital is woefully inadequate. Let's face it. Individually, we are bright. And particularly when we migrate or transmigrate, we are the best in the world. In neighborhoods or workplaces in Houston, Texas, or in New York, Mr. Khan or Mr. Chaudhary or Mr. Raja, they are the best. These whiz kids 
admired and appreciated and apl applauded by everybody. But here in Pakistan, we are not investing in human capital or new disciplines or in science and technology or innovation. We are not creating a knowledge economy here in Pakistan. Let's face it. And you'd be able to eliminate poverty if you invest in these disciplines. So <clears throat> that's what we need to do. I think that uh, with these remarks, it is my pleasant responsibility once again to thank the organizers of this conference and I leave this thought with you and probably I said the same thing last year and I would repeat it today that we have this China-Pakistan economic corridor and we are proud of it. It has opened new opportunities for us. It creates an interface between China and Pakistan. In fact, it, it deepens and strengthens the interface that we already had. But it has also made us a conduit and a destination for investment and entrepreneurship. We can become, we are becoming a regional hub for investment, for trade, for transportation, for connectivity. But are we creating our own corridors? And I think that we can create two corridors. One corridor branching out of this corridor should be a corridor to Southeast Asia, the other to Middle East and Africa. If we do that, we would multiply the benefits that we can get from China-Pakistan Economic Corridor or the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiatives, because you are passing the road in the belt. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. It has been a pleasure to talk to you.